Welcome to What the Theory with your man Joel. My name is Joel, and today we're going to be talking about uh, Michel Foucault's work on discipline and punish. Why? Because it matters. I'm pretending to cuss right there because if I was to cuss, this uh, wouldn't go to being made for kids, and I want kids to, to listen to this because it's very important. Um, the concept of power, as per Michel Foucault's work, is power is not traditionally what we think it is. It's not um, a judge. It's not uh, the guy at the top of um, a hierarchy. Necessarily, those are explicit forms of power. But power is more of like a social net that all of us um, move through. It is a milieu in which we all swim in. And more importantly, I think for us for today, what I wanted to talk about is the evolution of power across three types of societies. That is, societies of sovereignty, societies of discipline, and societies of control. So today we're going to be talking about the societies of sovereignty and the societies of disciplinary action. But first I wanted to talk to you about a concept called the panopticon. So the panopticon, if you look at this skull, for instance, uh, is a very evil <laughs> construction uh, that was um, created by Jeremy Bentham in the 1700s and the idea was for a prison in which the cells would be all along um, sort of a circular building so all the prison cells are in the walls and in the middle of that construction would be a tower which would be a panopticon. So whoever is standing in that tower can see all the cells at any given time. At any time whatever you're doing in that cell can be observed. But obviously that person won't be able to see everything at all times. But the very fact that you could be getting watched would affect the way the prisoners would behave. And that's a similar idea to what uh, Foucault takes on when we start talking about uh, societies that we live in, that you are always under surveillance. You're always being watched. And you being watched affects your behavior. But before I get into that, uh, let's talk about societies of sovereignty. So, in a discussion of power in societies, the first discussion we'd have is probably around um, a feudal society. The example he gives is, let's think of a king and his feudal subjects. If you think of living in that type of uh, arrangement, the sovereign, or whoever the ruler is, uh, taxes your production and rules on death. The law is about you breaking the rules of the king. Um, and you can see that also maybe even locally here at home in Uganda. If you're living in Buganda and you transgress a certain rule or a law, you're going against the king. You're going against the word of the sovereign. And the sovereign then has the power to punish you. But in your day-to-day, -day, whatever you do, however you choose to produce, however you choose to go about creating what it is that you create, that's up to you. You're given essentially that kind of freedom. But a tax is levied on whatever it is that you produce. So in the sovereign society, they tax your production. Uh, and if you break the law, if you go against the edicts of the sovereign, that's it. So he uses that to contrast it against the societies that we live in now, which are disciplinary societies. And a disciplinary society, if I can uh, sort of break that down with this quote, um, <clears throat> is this. Traditionally, power was what was seen, what was shown, and what was manifested. Disciplinary power, on the other hand, is exercised through its invisibility. At the same time, it imposes on those whom it subjects a principle of compulsory visibility. In discipline, it is the subjects who have to be seen. Their visibility assures the hold of the power that is exercised over them. So this is why I began talking about the panopticon. Uh, in a modern disciplinary society, Control is not levied only by the sovereign, but it is dispersed across different institutions. You'll think of schools, you'll think of uh, hospitals, prisons, uh, even workplaces. Now, the pushback you may have is that, well, those are not prisons per se, those are not, you know, it's a negative connotation to think of it as power. But power is a means of getting anything done. And so the analysis is um, how are human beings sort of controlled and disciplined and normalized. So there are three modes in which that's done. The first is by observation. So by observing your behavior, 
power is made more and more invisible, but you as the subject of power are made more and more visible. Think of when you're a student. You, they have to see your grades, they have to see how you perform, uh, the way you appear uh, is regulated. Your body and the spaces in which you have to move and uh, the spaces that you occupy are determined when you can go to have your break, when you can go home, when you can speak to your friends, when you can you know, go out and play in the field. All of that is sort of regulated by the, the power, the principal at the top in school. Then you move into a hospital. The doctors are the ones who determine what bed you're going to lay in, what kind of medication you're going to have, uh, and when you can and cannot have visitors. That moves on also to the workplace, where you're told when you're supposed to arrive, how you're supposed to speak, when you're supposed to um, uh, deliver your reports, etc., etc. A lot of life is about that motion from space to space in which your control and your behavior is sort of routinized. So it starts with observation. You're observed in terms of the way you operate. The next bit is normalization. There is the way things are supposed to be done, the way you're supposed to look, the way you're supposed to, I guess, address your elders. And there is a pressure that's then created because you're being observed for you to act within the normal uh, mode of operation. And then lastly, there's an examination. That examination gives you a rank, and that ranking is sort of a mark that that system or that institution uses to understand who you are. So think of me, for instance, in, in various institutions, I re represent different things through different numbers. To the bank, I'm a credit score. To school, I am my grades. To my family, I'm probably uh, the number of the child that I was when I was born. Uh, you know, my family has different things that they would consider me by. But you almost realize that in every major institution that you go into, your body was regulated. How you're meant to behave and how you're meant to, you know, what is considered normal is uh, almost a top-down affair. Now, in this quote that I was uh, trying to push through is that the idea is that disciplinary power is not about what you see, it's about you feeling seen. And when I was thinking about this, I thought about um, this um, idea of us having now a crowdsourced panopticon. The fact that we have cellular phones that at any given time, anything that you're doing could be captured. It would be captured, recontextualized, and shown around the world. More than ever, more than any human beings that have ever lived, we, are, we have the most images about ourselves, we have the most uh, documented about our lives and there is a pressure for us to have that narrative make sense. The pressure for us to have that narrative make sense is that something has to be normal about you. Uh, I think in the parlance everyone is saying normalize ETC, normalize ETC. That's no coincidence. The idea that Foucault puts forward is that the more you are visible, the more there is going to be a tendency for you to be uh, pushed towards the standard. And if you deviate from that, you feel an incredible either social pressure or you might even feel pressure from government authorities. And his analysis is that when we think of power, we usually think of it as the person who has an instrument of violence or someone who has been given access to certain tools beyond anyone else. But we exercise power over each other in the similar ways um, and in similar ways to uh, what he's talking about here in terms of the way we observe each other, the way we normalize behavior, and the way we examine each other, and then pass out a passing grade to the students that we call uh, B students. Uh, that determines then you know, what kind of further education they're going to have, which determines the kind of jobs that they're going to have, which determines the kind of adults that they're going to be, which determines the kind of capital they're going to be able to get access to. So these judgments and these ways in which we discipline each other uh, affect the kind of people that we end up being and the kinds of lives that we consider normal versus deviant. Let me continue this quote. Um, in discipline, it is the subjects who have to be seen. Their visibility assures the hold of the power that is exercised over them. It is the fact of being constantly seen, of being, of being able always to be seen that maintains the disciplined individual in his subjection. And the examination is the technique by which power, instead of emitting the signs of its potency, instead of imposing its mark on its subjects, holds them in a mechanism of objectification. In this space of domination, 
Disciplinary power manifests its potency essentially by arranging objects. The examination is, as it were, the ceremony of this objectification. Now, that's the final point I wanted to make. Um, I think, especially with talking with people who are a little bit off, <laughs> who are a little bit deviant, uh, most people deviate from society in one way or another, but we often want to do that away from the public eye, away from the, even the people that we love, we don't want them to see you know, those true desires or those true ways that we you know, sort of move away from center. And the reason for that is a lot of our public life is very objectified. You become the subject of um, you know, eyeballs, of a, a silent crowd that's always watching you and always giving you that pressure to be normalized. And the people who break away from that, we see them suffer. They suffer from uh, either being uh, mocked, ridiculed, uh, or even sometimes they can be uh, removed from society. They're put into places and cordoned off where we don't see them anymore. Uh, the interesting thing in this book is um, that in, in many societies, people who are mad used to roam the streets and were seen almost as oracles. There were people that you know, had a certain version of life that no one else understood. But in modern society, those people are you know, probably sent to Butabika and we try not to talk about them or they're kept in the back rooms where they won't make anyone uncomfortable. So the question for me, to you and the question for myself is, how am I exercising the power I have uh, in disciplining other people? Am I pressuring someone to be more normal? Or am I giving them you know, the ease of mind or the ease with which they can express things that are a little bit off of center? And in a society of discipline, uh, another piece is that you then also become um, your own subjugator. Because you feel that people are watching you, it's almost like if you enter a grocery store and see a camera. Uh, no one has to be watching you, but you will behave like someone's watching you, and that's enough. That's how discipline is uh, meted out in uh, the lives that we live, and we become agents of that kind of discipline as well. So um, every time I'm commenting now, every time I'm you know, sort of making <laughs> a commentary on social media about someone else's life, uh, I pause for a second and think, uh, am I just another piece of that crowdsourced panopticon uh, in disciplining an individual and in disciplining them, what am I making normal? Uh, thank you for listening. Goodbye.